I'd like you to just ponder this map for a moment. People will talk about, well, the Syrian government, you know, isn't it, is brutal or this and that. But I'd like you to consider this point. In the United States of America, we have the huge northern border, which is friendly Canada. East and west, we have the two largest oceans in the world that go around the south. We have one border with one country that is not even belligerent, and we cannot for the life of us figure out what to do about that border. It causes us no end of, pro of problems. You look at these borders in the most complicated area of the world, and you tell me that that can be uh, governed by a weak you know, democracy that is ruled by committee. Very difficult. I personally, I don't see Western-style democracy working under in that situation. That being said, there are a lot of democratic structures in Syria. It has had a constitution since 1928. It was one of the founding member states of the United Nations. They uh, regularly hold president elections. They hold parliamentary elections. They've gone, under Bashar al-Assad, from one political party to 23. Uh, the, um, the Constitution is a solid document guaranteeing religious freedom. Uh, Senator Black feels, and I feel, that it's even stronger than our own in some aspects about that. Women have equal rights in Syria. They have equal pay for equal work. The vice president of Syria is a woman. The leader of parliament is a woman. Dr. Shaban is the top political advisor. Uh, women fly jets in the, in the air force. They're navy captains in the navy. They're soldiers. They're professors, teachers, scientists, you name it, business owners. Compare and contrast that with Saudi Arabia, who we call our greatest ally in the fight to bring freedom and democracy to Syria, where women are virtually property and have virtually no, you know, no right to do anything they can't even drive. So at this point, I've been in Damascus, which is down here in this corner, and I want to travel to a very special place called Malula. And before I get there, though, I want to talk about the, the journey up to Malula, because there's a special story. Everywhere throughout Syria are military checkpoints, and you're thankful for them. There's soldiers everywhere. You're stopped every so often. Your car is checked. Your paperwork is checked, what have you. There's a million AK-47s uh, walking the streets. And, but when you go, when you leave Damascus and you head out to another area, you pass by the major checkpoint. On the, on the Damascus Road, and this is run by a colonel. So we get to the checkpoint, and Husay runs the uh, paperwork in to the colonel and tells him briefly about who I am, what I'm doing there. Next thing I know, the colonel himself comes out to the taxi, and he motions me to get out of the car. And, of course, I did that. And he holds out his hand to shake my hand, and he and I shake his hand, and he just holds on to it. And this guy, I mean, he is like the soldier's soldier, just weather. He's got these intense blue eyes that are like lasers. I just feel like they're reading my mind and my soul, you know. And he's just thanking me, thanking me, thanking me for coming to Syria and seeing for myself what is really going on there. And he invited me, invited us into the bunker and shared coffee and cigarettes, you know, and when a guy like that offers you a cigarette, you take it. <laughs> <laughs> and he's talking about the army and his love of his homeland and the soldiers are there. And, and that actually happened twice. Um, twice I had to leave Damascus like that. And, uh, you know, I asked him the question, what do you want me to tell the people back home? Tell them there are no moderate rebels. Tell them we love Americans. Tell them we hate what their government is doing. And he said, and he was like almost commanding me to go back and share this with you all. I found out after I returned home about two weeks later 
uh, that uh, one of the rebels had blown up that um, checkpoint with a uh, hand grenade. And the colonel and his men are, are gone now, right in that bunker where I spent um, some very nice times. He was a very gracious man. So we're heading to Malula. Now, Malula is known as the ancient Christian enclave. There are these huge cliffs, and then there's this valley. And um, I thought I had a picture of the whole valley. But it is the place where, one of few places in the world where the people there still speak Aramaic, and they do their worship services in Aramaic. Now, uh, a few years back, uh, the Free Syrian Army, who we call moderate rebels, uh, combined with al-Nusra, which is al-Qaeda in Syria, and they attacked and took over Malula. The Syrian army took it back, but then the rebels again retook it. And they set about destroying the churches. They looted uh, so many precious artifacts, manuscripts, ancient manuscripts. These churches, um, there was one chapel I was in that was like from 60 AD. But the monasteries and orphanages are from 600, 400 AD. Uh, the altar behind us there, the altarpiece there was uh, from the 4th century. And they uh, desecrated and destroyed many of the uh, precious icons that were in the church. And burned a lot of the buildings, destroyed a lot of the homes. The Syrian army was able to retake it. And uh, the priest, uh, Father Tafik, and the mayor gave me a tour. It was a little difficult to get in there because it's a military zone still. It's kind of like a ghost town now. Whereas before the war, it would receive about 200,000 visitors every year. Many of them Muslims. And this is a precious, sacred site in Syria. I know one of the Syrian army guys who was part of the, the mission going in to recapture Malula. He's a captain in the army. And, he, and he's an Alawite, and he said, Jan, when I walked into the valley with my guys, I could feel this peace just rising up from the ground, going up my boots, up my legs, up my whole body. And he turned to his, his men, and he said, don't you put any bullet where it doesn't absolutely have to go. We will not destroy this place. You know, we will not destroy this place. We will not damage this place any more than has to happen to regain this territory. Um, the mayor, very kind man, uh, he and his wife, uh, their six-year-old son was killed in Damascus by a rebel mortar attack. The rebels on the outskirts of town, uh, directly supported by the United States government, routinely law mortars into the civilian areas in Damascus. They were in Damascus at the time. The son was killed by one of those. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, there was a mortar attack uh, just down the street from where my nice hotel was in the old part of Damascus. They just hit a restaurant with four mortars. Uh, eight young people were killed, 12 people wounded. The whole restaurant destroyed. <coughs> Can you back your background on Alawite? What is that? Alawite, um, it's considered a Muslim sect, but they, uh, for example, they don't go to mosque. They have one wife. They drink alcohol. They celebrate Easter and Christmas. Um, they're a very secretive group. Um, they are. Uh, Amazingly strong people. When, I'll talk a little more about the Alawites when we get to Lataki, because that's kind of the homeland of that sect. So they're not Sunni? No, they're not Sunni. They're considered an offshoot of Shiite, of the Shiites. Uh, but in, in Western press, that's how they're designated, is a Shiite group, so that it can look like it's Sunni versus Shiite. Um, but they are a whole group unto themselves. I don't know if you would even call them. No, they're not Shiites. No, they're not Shiites. They're not. I agree. And they would say that too. But that's how they're portrayed in, in the press. 
Actually, they align with uh, Assad. They align with Assad. Yes, yes. That doesn't mean there isn't. Yeah. Um, this is us. We're literally on this balcony. They're telling you stories of the war there. And, um, you know, the mayor's wife has baked us cookies. And it was just kind of a surreal experience being there with those guys, very gentle uh, men. So now I moved from Damascus up to uh, Latakia. And as I said, that's considered the homeland of the Alawites, uh, mostly in the, in the hill area there. Latakia is a seaside resort city, beautiful. So we're driving up uh, the road to Latakia, and my friend says, the uh, government has arranged for you to have a hotel room in Latakia. And I said, great, you know, sounds good. Well, the hotel room they had arranged for me it was this <laughs> luxury suite in the La Mira Resort right on the water's edge with this huge private balcony and all the room service I could order, and which ended up being a great base of operations because I had made many friends over there, and so they would come visit me in my posh digs, you know, and we would, have, we would enjoy the time together. Uh, it's a beautiful place. One of the first pla places I went to there was to meet with the governor of Latakia. And he and I spent almost an hour and a half together. And uh, he appreciated my heart as well. We talked and talked and talked. At the end of it, he said, whatever you want to do, wherever you want to go, whatever you want to talk to is fine. What do you want to do? I said, well, I want to see a refugee center. I want to visit a hospital. And I want to visit the tomb of President Hafez al-Assad, and I'd like to go to Wadi Maluk, which uh, is a beautiful place. So he arranged all that for me. During the time in Latakia, usually I did was accompanied by soldiers. Uh, in fact, I would often have this whole little entourage uh, with me, with the ministry guy, and the tourism guy, and this guy, and that guy. And we were having a pretty good time. The refugee center I went to uh, houses families that had fled Idlib. And Idlib uh, is an area, I'll show you a map in a second. Uh, an army called the Army of Conquest had come in from Turkey, uh, designated, the, you know, we call them rebels, etc., etc. But the Army of Conquest is dominated by Al Nusra, which is Al Qaeda in Syria, Arar al Sham and other groups uh, that made up this, this army. And they rampaged uh, through Idlib. These were brutal stories. I mean, there's just one family after another. And oftentimes, the women would tell me their husband was murdered, uh, uncle, brother, sons, uh, most of them slaughtered. You know, usually they'll either slit the throat with a knife or cut the whole head off with a knife. A lot of these children now have no fathers. And it was just one story like that after another. Uh, Idlib is up there. You see Latakia and the Idlib area. One of the primary reasons this war has gone on so long is Turkey has acted as basically the as the highway to heaven, or the highway to hell, if you will, for tens and tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of what we call jihadists, people who are bent on um, helping this, what is truly a, 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 a radicalized fundamentalist revolution for the most part in Syria. And literally, these guys, uh, just recently, another 5,000 came over the border of Turkey. Turkey has been notorious in its aid and abetting of ISIS. Uh, my research shows that Erdogan, the president's son, is the distributor of ISIS oil. Um, and ISIS oil flows from Turkey into Israel and Europe. This is a very important point. The rich oil fields are, are in this area here, which is 
for the most part, you know, Al Raqqa is where the ISIS capital is, Deir ez -Zor, a lot of Nusra, I guess, is there. When the war started, or at some point, the West put severe sanctions on Syria. And one of those was they were not allowed to sell their oil. They were not allowed to export their oil. However, in 2013, the European Union dropped those sanctions for oil coming from rebel-held areas. And this was one of the major factors that allowed ISIS to get so well funded was because the, ISIS, the Europe was allowed to buy ISIS oil. And, and there you can see, I mean, there was just tanker after tanker, hundreds and hundreds of tankers on these roads going up into Turkey to sell this oil. Uh, when the Russians came in, um, they were like, if the U.S. is so interested in fighting ISIS, why haven't they hit these convoys of oil tankers? But they can tell what color my bathing suit is when I go swimming in my pond, you know? And you're telling me that in the middle of the desert they can't see these lines of, of oil tankers. And the Russians took out, what, more than half. Um, and significantly cut on the funding of ISIS. These are the kids of the refugee center. Um, just precious. They were following me around everywhere and holding on to me. And just real sweeties. I also visited the Tishreen Hospital, which is part of the Tishreen University in Latakia. This is like, that's my whole entourage there. All those people are following us around. And I met with the administrator of the hospital and the doctors and nurses there. And this brings up a very important point about this conflict. Because again, I asked them the question, what do you want me to tell the people back home? They said the same thing. But they added significantly to it when they were talking about the sanctions <coughs> that are put on Syria. So for example, in a hospital like this, very professional, clean, these people just work so hard. And but because of Western sanctions, they are not able to get um, transplant medications. They can't get, it's very difficult to get chemotherapy medications. And most importantly, before the war, they had made huge investments in Western medical technology. And now they can't get replacement parts for those. One of the administrators of one of the hospitals I went to said he was practiced in France and Russia. He said, I was in the Soviet Union in the height of the Cold War, and America was shipping us medical equipment then. And now in Syria, they won't allow us to get it. They can't get uh, uh, prosthetics for people who lose their limb. They make a lot of prosthetics there. They're brilliant industrialists and inventors, but there are certain advanced ones that they can't make, and they're having uh, difficulty getting them. The thing about sanctions is, it is not a humane way to get our way in a country. What it is, is a slow strangulation of a population, so they get so miserable, they will rise up against their government for us. And again and again and again, people brought this up. A lot of people that I talked to who wanted to leave Syria were not wanting to leave because of the violence, some were. But a lot of them feel that there is no future there. Whereas before the war, they were feeling there was a future. Now, for example, because of inflation, the, the Syrian pound used to be 50 Syrian pounds to one US dollar. And now, for sake of ease of conversion, it's about 500 to one. It, it varies. So let's say I wanted to buy a pair of jeans before the war. It would cost me $30. Now it's a $300 pair of jeans, and my salary has stayed the same. And that's affected cooking oil, heating oil, um, gas for your cars, food. Very, it's just a brutal way of treating people. Were the refugees uh, Christian? They can't be visited? No, they were Muslim. And why were there, there, there 
husband and brother have been executed. That's a good point. The Syrian army is made up of Sunnis, Alawites, Christian Druze. There are Kurds fighting in the army. It is a conscript army. It's representative of the population. The, um, the rebels are virtually 100% Sunni radicalized fundamentalists. Now, um, and there were Christians uh, sent out from it, for sure. I know a guy in Iraq who's a Sunni Muslim who fled in the, uh, before the army of conquest. Um, but if you don't believe exactly as they believe, you will be harmed. Uh, ISIS was brutal to Sunnis in, in uh, Felicia. So brutal in Congo ministers. And, and in fact, I talked to guys in the army who, uh, and they'll tell you very often, uh, the army will defend a Christian area even uh, before a Muslim area because they are so intent on maintaining the religious diversity within Syria. Um, it, it's, it's an extraordinary story when you just interact with these people of the level of diversity and the level of tolerance and the level of, of mutual interaction. Uh, this is at uh, President Hampa's uh, al assads tomb in Latakia. Very beautiful, peaceful place, and I just spent some time there praying for Syria. I don't like this computer. She was the first American to visit. Uh, well, I, I need to find out about that, but one of the few Americans, I think, to visit that tomb. Yeah, please. Brilliant. Okay, so <laughs> this is Wadi Maluk, and it's like an oasis. Uh, Syria has many uh, areas that are beautiful and green. There are these rolling hills. It's a very fruitful country. There's olive groves everywhere, orchards everywhere. Um, the produce, I mean, you go to the produce market, and it's just full of these beautiful fruits and vegetables. Uh, here we're in the hills outside of Latakia, and there's this beautiful oasis area called Wadi Maluk. And we had our contingent of three Syrian <laughs> soldiers. This guy's been in the army for eight years. Uh, the other guys have been in like six. They've been fighting terrorists for a long time. Very, very kind to us. We treated them to a great lunch. One thing that impressed me about the soldiers that I met there um, and it's a conscript army, so, you know, you get all kinds in there. But these guys that I talk to, their lives are miserable. It's a hard war. They're fighting a terrible enemy. Um, but they will not stop. You know, they, they're just not going to stop fighting until the last man's gone or until they win this thing. And I think they're representative of a good bit of the Syrian armed forces. This uh, necklace was given to me by a Syrian soldier who had been serving for six years. <laughs>